You're listening to the Belly Dance Geek Clubhouse at bellydancegeek.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Episode 5 of the Belly Dance Geek Clubhouse. I'm Nadira Jamal, and I'm so glad that you could join me. The Clubhouse is a place where dancers can get all of that stuff that's hard to get in classes and DVDs. Most belly dance instruction focuses on the what, so things like repertoire, movement, choreography, combinations. But it can be really hard to get information on the why and the how, so things like stagecraft, dynamics, professionalism, ethics, and business. So every month I'm going to interview a different guest expert on a different topic related to the why and the how. And we'll always have some question and answer time so you can geek out too. So if you think that knowledge and creativity go together like chocolate and peanut butter, you're in the right place. My guest today is music attorney Valerie Lovely. And we're also going to be joined by paralegal Joy Grambois, who dances as Selkuth. So let me tell you a little bit about our guest. Uh, Attorney Valerie Lovely has been a musician for most of her life. And prior to becoming a lawyer, she earned her Bachelor of Music degree in film scoring from Berklee College of Music here in Boston. She plays several instruments, has performed in rock bands, chamber groups, wind ensembles, and on studio projects. She's composed music in various styles for use on a variety of media, and she understands musicians and artists because she is one herself. Attorney Lovely represents a wide variety of clients, including musicians, event producers, dancers, and filmmakers. And she believes that the client is best served when provided with an understanding of how the music and entertainment industries work and a basic knowledge of how to protect their rights. She uses plain and direct language to explain legal concepts and contract terms in a way that's clear to those who may not be experienced in the music and entertainment industries. Attorney Lovely speaks around New England about the legal aspects of the music industry at events and to legal and industry organizations. She's spoken at events sponsored by the American Bar Association and Berkeley College of Music, Suffolk Law School, the Massachusetts Bar Association, the University of New Hampshire School of Law, and the Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts in Massachusetts and Maine. She teaches music law and music business at Berkeley College of Music and Berkeley Online, and has provided instruction at the Intellectual Property Summer Institute, which is the IPSI, the Business of Music Summer Program, the Recording Artists Project at Harvard Law School, and for the Arts and Business Council's Musicians Professional Toolbox. She was also a guest speaker in copyright law courses at the University of New Hampshire School of Law and Suffolk University Law School. So ladies, you are in good hands tonight. (laughs) So uh, let me also tell you a little bit about Joy. Uh, Let me double check my notes here, actually. I do want to make sure I don't miss anything. So Joy Fonbois, uh, also known as Selkuth, is a writer, dancer, and performing artist who lives in Portland, Maine. A lifelong dancer, she entered the world of belly dance seven years ago to the side door of Rock's Gothique after falling in love with its dramatic storytelling nature. Since then, she's also studied cabaret and Turkish styles of dance, which only made her fall more deeply in love with the art form. She finds her inspiration in stories from mythology and folklore with a particular love for the Brothers Grimm, as well as tales of personal transformation. She's a percussionist in training and loves, yes, loves to play the Zills. So she and I are uh, percussion sisters there. And for the past five years, Selkuth has been the mistress of Dark Follies, a gothic vaudeville-inspired variety show uh, troupe based in Portland, Maine. And she's also the co-founder of Rocks for Sergum, Portland's monthly community belly dance night. Selkuth performs around New England with Dark Follies and as a solo artist. She teaches theatrical and experimental belly dance at Bright Star World Dance in Portland. In 2006, she earned her associate's degree in paralegal studies, and in that same year, she sat for and passed the National Association of Legal Assistants Certified Paralegal Exam. She met Attorney Lovely in 2011 when she encountered issues with obtaining music rights for a Dark Holly stage show, after which she brought Attorney Lovely to Portland to lead a workshop on copyrights for performers. They enjoyed working together so much that they decided to make the arrangement more permanent, and it turned out to be a legal match made in heaven, and the rest is history. So welcome, ladies. Thank you. It's great to be here. 
Thank you. All right. So I'm going to jump in. Um, Attorney Lovely and Joy are going to talk to us tonight about copyright concerns for belly dancers. Now, it's important to note that copyright law varies quite a bit from country to country, and tonight we're only going to be covering United States copy law, copyright laws. So while some of the concepts may transfer to other countries, we really are talking about uses and doing business here in the U.S. So those of you who live in the U.S., uh, this applies to you. And those of you who are doing things like selling DVDs in the U.S., these are the laws that are going to apply to you. Um, Attorney Lovely, are there any additional disclaimers you'd like to give before we get started? <laughs> um, I think that covers it. Okay, great. Uh, it may also be worth mentioning that um, you know we, you are getting factual advice from a lawyer, but none of this should be considered personal legal advice. So uh, by listening to this call, you are not becoming Attorney Lovely's client. That's something that can happen <laughs> separately. <laughs> uh, but she's sharing us with information. All right. So uh, before we get started, let me just give everybody a little bit of background on what's going to happen. Um, I have a great interview with some fabulous questions uh, that Attorney Lovely and Joy are going to help us answer. And then at the end, we are going to have some time for question and answer. So if you've got a pen and you want to jot down any questions as you go, uh, keep those in mind for the question and answer period. And those of you who are listening on the webcast, there's a little box on the left that says submit your question for the event here. If you have any questions during the event, you can type those in whenever it's convenient, and we'll get to them during the Q&A session. All right. So let's jump right in. So you know, one thing that I noticed is that belly dancers as artists really tend to respect the idea of copyright. You know, we know how much work goes into creating things, and we really believe that the people who create them deserve to be compensated and recognized for the work that they've done. But the problem is, is that copyright and licensing can be this really complicated, scary topic. So most of us want to do the right thing, but it can be really hard to tell what the right thing is and how to go mm -hmm. about it. So before we jump into the specific questions about teaching and DVDs and specific applications, I'd like to really start with the basics. Uh, so Valerie, can you tell us what copyright is exactly? Well, copyright is an area of federal law that applies to creative works. It's really about the expression of creativity. So things like music and art and dancing are all expressions of creativity, and that's what this area of law is really focused on protecting. And you know, can you clarify what the difference between a copyright and a trademark is? Sure. Um, copyright, like I said, it's all about protecting the expression of creativity. And trademark is more about branding. It's about identifying the source of a product or a service through a logo or a name. So to give you an example of the intersection of copyright and trademark, because I know it can get a little bit confusing, if I were an artist and I created a logo for for these wonderful series of talks, um, my art would be copyrighted because I created something original and I fixed it in a tangible way and now my artwork is copyrightable. Now when you start using the logo that I made for you to mean this series of talks, now it's functioning as a trademark because when we see that logo, we think of you and your talks. So you can have something that the design itself is covered by copyright law because it's an expression of creativity, but it's used like a trademark when we see that or we hear the name and we think of the source of the product or service. Gotcha. And for those of you who are curious, Belly Dance Geek trademark is pending. I have my application <laughs> stuff in process. Congratulations. So, uh, don't steal my business name. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, can you tell us uh, what kinds of things can be copyrighted? Well, anything that expresses creativity, things like music and art and dance, photography, sculptures, even some software programming is considered creative enough that it's covered by copyright law as well. Now, I should say a little thing about music that will help when we get into talking about what you need to do to get permission. In music, for every well, almost every recorded song that you hear, there's two separate copyrights involved. The first one has to do with the song itself. So if you think like sheet music is a great way to conceptualize it, that would be like the melody and any lyrics and the harmonies. That would be the song itself. So the songwriter that created it is the one that has those rights. Now, once that song is created, then lots of different people could make recordings of it. So every recording that's made of that composition, it 
is able to get its own copyright as well. So this is really important with music that there's those two different copyrights going on. Now with dance, dance is copyrightable as well. And what is copyrightable about dance is again, expression of creativity. So choreography is definitely something that falls within copyright as well. Excellent. Now, is there any kind of guideline about how big a thing needs to be in order to be copyrighted? So for example, I've heard that choreography can be copyrighted, but an individual combination may or may not be. Yeah, it's 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 very interesting the way that it works because copyright is about the expression of creativity, but it's not about taking away the ability of others to express their creativity. So, like, I'm not familiar with the individual moves in belly dance, but I, I took ballet when I was a kid. So if you think about, like, a plie, most people know what that is. Um, the plie itself would not be copyrightable because everybody wants to be able to use the plie in their routines without having to go and license it from one person. Mm -hmm. But if I take the plie and I add a bunch of other steps and movements and arm movements and, and all of that and I make a combination from it, then that's getting more towards my expression of my vision, my idea of how everyone should move. So that's getting more towards copyrightable. And then when you take a whole series of movements and you make like a two or three minute long dance, that would be choreography that is definitely covered by copyright. Excellent. And yeah, so there's that little gray area in the middle that that may or may not be covered. Yeah, when I've done my own copyright research, I keep running into the gray area. <laughs> <laughs> Just about everything in law has a little bit of a gray area. Yeah, well that's good, that keeps it flexible. Yes. Yeah, we're always running into new situations and new uh, legal problems, so just like in arts. So mm -hmm. yeah, how does a work become copyrighted? Well, it's interesting because all you need to actually have all your rights under copyright law is to have something that's original and fixed in a tangible way. And by original, it's not like you have to do research and find out, okay, I just did this routine. Has anybody in the history of the world ever put these moves together? after each other. It's not like that. It's just if it's original when you created it, um, then that satisfies the originality. And then fixed in a tangible way, uh, for dance, that could be you make a video of it or you use like some notation or some way that you could pass it to somebody else and they would know what you meant to do. And that's okay, all so you need. And with that, you get all of the rights under copyright law. So, for example, if you taught it to your students in class, it would not necessarily be copyrighted unless you gave them copyright notes or a video or made yeah, it. In right, unless you fixed it in some way. Um, mm -hmm. it, it would be difficult. Like if you asked each of those students two months later, how did that routine go? You're probably going to get a bunch of different variations on it because not everyone's going to remember it the same way. But if you have it written down or videoed, we have an exact copy of what it is that you intended. So that's that's why you need the fixation part. Gotcha. Now I've heard that there's also a way to register a copyright. Is that something, I think it sounds like you just said that it's not something that you have to do. Is it ever worthwhile? Um, it's not something you have to do, but it is something that is worthwhile um, because under the law, and we've all heard of copyright infringement lawsuits, and um, the way that you can protect your rights is to have proof of ownership and the ability to use a court system to enforce your rights. Now the only way that you can use a copyright infringement lawsuit as incentive for people to play nice is if you have your federal copyright registration in place. You can't file a lawsuit without the federal copyright registration. So that's one reason why you would want to is to protect your rights, but also it gives you proof of ownership and a government piece of paper that says you created that dance and you registered on that day. So we know when you created it. Interesting. So does that mean that you can't bring a lawsuit if you don't have it registered or is it more difficult to prove your case through other well, evidence? You can file after some, like say you have, you created some choreography for something and then somebody else sneaks in a camera and they, they video it and then they take it to their dance troupe and then they're going to do something else with it and you want to stop that because that's yours. If 
you want to file the lawsuit after they've infringed upon you, you can then you can file your, your registration and then file the lawsuit, but the most important remedies are off the table. One of the most important remedies you can get is if you win, they pay your legal fees and your attorney fees, and that can be a really beneficial thing because these things get really expensive. And the other thing is statutory damages where they do math on this much per infringement, so you don't have to prove what the actual damage was. You just show, look, they did it, and then the judge does math and then awards you an award. So those two are off the table if you file after the infringement takes place. I see. And do you know how much about it costs to register? It's thirty-five dollars. Oh my goodness! I was thinking you know, in the three hundred dollar range, like a trademark application. <laughs> nope, nope. It's really pretty simple. Um, there's an electronic filing system. I'm not positive. I've never filed a copyright for a dance before, um, but it's pretty much the same process as the dramatic work and it would be a $35 application if you did it online. Wow. I really need to get cracking on some of my stuff then if it's that cheap. <laughs> I've been thinking about it as a trade-off, right? Well, you know, do I really want to spend a couple hundred dollars on this versus <laughs> the likelihood of it getting infringed on? But at $35, how can you not? Exactly. A lot of people think the same way. They think it must be really expensive, but it's relatively inexpensive. And the other thing is, like, say you have a whole bunch of routines that you'd like to register. You can register them as a collection with one application, one application fee. Ooh. The only catch is you have to be 100% the rights owner for every single thing that you're registering. Or, like, if the three of us on the call... Um, did dances together and we worked together and we had 10 dances we wanted to register and all three of us are equal owners in all of them, we could do that as a collection as well. But it has to be identical ownership for everything that's being included in the collection. Okay. Wow, that is really useful to know. I'm so glad you mentioned that. So oh, good. Um, so you know, once, you, once you have created the thing and you have it in a fixed form, whether registered or not, how mm -hmm. long does a copyright last? Well, it depends. For works, like if we created something now or you know, within the last couple of decades, it would be our lifetime plus 70 years. And older uh, things vary, is that right? Yeah, if you go before, I like to say if it's from the 70s or before that, you want to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis because the copyright law changed in the mid-70s and things that came before that, there's sort of a patchwork of rules and regulations that you have to look at. Um, so it's easier just to say if it's in the 70s, I'm going to look it up, or, or before I'm going to look it up, but if it's from the 80s forward, just as a nice clean number, um, then it's life of the author plus 70 years. Now, there's still a few exceptions with that, like if it's an anonymous work or a pseudonymous work or a corporation owns it, then it's a different duration, but for our intents and purposes, if we're registering something that we created, it's our lifetime plus 70 years. Gotcha. And after the copyright expires, my understanding is that then goes into the public domain. Can you explain a little bit about what that means? Sure. Um, while we have copyright, as copyright owners, we can decide how our work is used. Once it goes into the public domain, anyone in the public can use it however they want. They don't have to ask anyone for permission. They don't have to pay anyone anything. It's just free to the public to use. And my understanding is that some of the philosophy behind that is that at a certain point, things just become a part of our culture the way that Shakespeare is a part of our culture. Yeah, or Bach or Beethoven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Now, copyright terms vary from country to country. Isn't that right? It, it is true, yes. There are okay. differences all around the world. Now, one thing that I've run into that's really interesting when I was doing research for my video production project uh, is that things can be out of copyright. So, so a song written in Egypt can be out of copyright in Egypt but still covered under copyright in the U.S. Uh, do you have any information to share about that? Well, there's no quick answer to that because just like in the U.S. with things before the 70s, it's a whole patchwork. It's a similar patchwork depending on which country, when they signed a treaty, or when they entered certain groups. So what I recommend is Cornell University has this marvelous chart that they update every January, 
and it goes through all of the what ifs. So they have a whole section on foreign works that says if this, then it's in the public domain. If that, then it's not. And it, it's really a great source. So you can go through on a song by song basis and really get a good idea of whether it's in the public domain or not. That is awesome. I'm going to have to dig that up and send that out with the show notes because that would have saved me so much time in the past. Yes, it's a great chart. They, they update it every January and it's so helpful. Wonderful. Now, you know, if a work is still under copyright, you know, mm-hmm. when something is under copyright, kind of the point is that the person who created it has control over it, over how it's used, whether they get paid for it, and so on. Are there any circumstances under which you don't need permission when something is still under copyright? Um, hmm. The only one I can think of would be if you were at a venue that the venue itself was licensed to use whatever music you wanted to use then you could go in there and dance to whatever music you wanted to, and you wouldn't have to ask any permission because the venue itself was already licensed. But other than that, you usually have to ask permission. Okay. Now, there's a whole category of things called fair use. Can you tell mm-hmm. us a little about, bit about that? Sure. Um, a lot of times when I'm working with musicians, their definition of fair use is – sort of based around the sense of fairness that you get on the playground. Like, that should be fair because in my sense of fairness, that should be how it works. But fair use is actually a legal term, and courts have sort of a list of what they consider fair use and what not. And the types of things that that would be fair use are very limited. So... A lot of people will think, well, education, they've heard educational uses are a fair use, but it's limited to accredited nonprofit educational institutions. So think like public schools that want to show some art or play some music or things like that. That would be covered under fair use. Um, Other things would be um, if you're trying to criticize something. So if you were doing a critique of a dancer, you would want to be able to show what they were doing that you're critiquing. That would probably lean towards being fair use because it it helps to be able to show what you're critiquing when you're critiquing it. Um, If you're doing a news broadcast, um, that goes towards the public interest, so sometimes that's covered by fair use. If there's some music in the background but you're interviewing somebody, um, that would be okay because it's com- almost impossible to filter everything out. Um, nonprofit is more towards fair use than commercial use, and commercial use doesn't necessarily mean you're making money. Commercial use could also mean things that you're doing that benefit your business. So if you were to do a free dance demonstration, you might think, well, I don't need to license because that would be fair use. I'm not making any money. We're just doing a demonstration. But if the demonstration is meant to recruit new students and you're passing out flyers afterwards and saying, hey, come on down. You can get half off your first lesson or something like that, then that free exhibition is more towards commercial use. Even though you didn't charge for it, it was commercial in nature. So it's like advertising. So it's it's one of those gray areas where you have to kind of look at what you're doing. And the more on the side of nonprofit, non-commercial, educational in that nonprofit setting, um, that would be fair use. Gotcha. So I know that was a long, rambling answer, but it's such a gray area, it's kind of hard to explain it really quickly. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, one thing that, I've, that relates to this gray area that I've read is that, you know, there are pretty much no circumstances under which you can't be sued. It just has to do with how well protected you are if somebody chooses to do that. Is well, that right? <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not really sure what, what you meant by so, that. So, you know... But, you know, let, let's say that, you know, you think you've, you know, covered your bases under fair use, you think you're okay. You know, it, it, it seems like, you know, even if you've done a good job, somebody could sue you, they just wouldn't necessarily win. Um, well, the law is really clear about what someone suing you has to prove in order to win. Mm-hmm. And so first they would have to show 
that copyright registration we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. So if they have the copyright registration and they can show that they're the owner and you're not, the second thing they'd have to show is that you had access to their copyrighted work. Mm -hmm. um, access can be shown through, um, if it's like something really popular, it's just assumed that you had access. Um, or it can be shown if you were at a clinic and you had actual contact with somebody, that would be access. And then there has to be a similarity between their original work and what you did. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the part that they have to prove. So if they don't have the registration and they can't show the access and they can't show the similarity between the two works, then they don't really have a lawsuit and it probably isn't going to go very far. And a good attorney that practices in court isn't going to take the case because they can't prove it, so it's their reputation on the line. So usually, um, in copyright law anyway, there has to be a basis for it. In, in order to move forward. Gotcha. All right, so we've covered some great basics. I'd like to talk a little bit more about some of the specifics uh, involved. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is licensing music. So, you know, a lot of dancers and people in general think that, you know, if they've bought a CD or a download, that they own that thing. And so, but under law, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can do anything with you that you want with it. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah, so when I was when we first started out and I was talking about all you needed to do to have copyright is you had to have something that's original and fixed in a tangible way. Well, when you have those two things, it's like immediately, you don't have to file any, just like at that moment that you fixed the original thing down, you receive six exclusive rights under copyright law. And those six exclusive rights include reproduction and distribution, which when you release a CD, you have authorized the making of the copy as well as the distribution of that copy. So that's what the rights owner has allowed. Now, there are four other rights under copyright law, and one of them is public performance of the composition. So a public performance of the composition, that right wasn't given when the rights owner said, I'm going to allow my music to be sold. So that's why, I mean, it sounds kind of weird, but that's why people get into trouble when they think that they can do whatever they want with it because the rights owner is only allowed certain things, not all things. Okay, so you may have bought the physical CD, but not the rights to do various things with it. Exactly. It's a limited right that you've been granted for private use. Okay. And so it, it sounds like the rules definitely are different for private use versus public. So you know, what counts as a public performance? A public performance under the law is a performance that's done outside of your normal circle of family and friends, um, and it's public. So, like, if you had a barbecue and you invited your friends and family over and you played some music and you did some dancing, that would be private use. But if you went to a public park and sent out flyers and tweeted that you were going to be there and 100 people show up and you have a sound system with huge speakers and you do all the same things you did in your backyard, this is now a public performance because it's open to the public and it's outside of your circle of family and friends. So that's the real distinction is the audience going from public and private. Um, you, of course, Again, there's that gray area that happens. So if you think about like a wedding where if it was just the small wedding that most people think they're going to have and it's like you know, immediate family and friends, that might be a, a private event. But most weddings get out of hand and there's hundreds of people and people that you don't even know, friends of friends and the second cousins, then it becomes a public performance because it, it crossed that line outside of immediate circle of family and friends. Huh. I wouldn't have thought a wedding was uh, was big enough to do that. That's really good to know. <laughs> yep. So it depends on the another, setting. Okay, like, yeah. Gray area like that. You know, what if I invited my students, so this is a business relationship, but to a private holiday party at my home? Okay. Hmm. And I wanted to put music on. You know, it's, it's a private party with a limited guest list, but I've also got that business relationship with the students. 
So that's well, definitely so getting, setting, but you don't have to give me legal advice on this. Call. Yeah. Okay. Well, just as a good hypothetically, area. hypothetically, um, because it's your private home, um, a lot of times when something is in your private home and it's closed off from the public, that sort of leans towards being a private event. Um, when it spills out into the street, that's when we start going more toward the public events. Mm -hmm. So um, it's tricky. It's tricky because, like, if you think about, um, like, a college dormitory setting, if somebody wants to play a movie in their dorm room and open the door and let whoever wants to come in come in, um, that might be okay. But if the RA on the floor decides let's have a movie night and invites the whole floor down to the lounge to watch it. Now that's a public performance. Same movie, same kids, but the setting changed. I've been the kid in that situation a lot. I hope nobody got in trouble for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you can see that it, it's, it's tricky. Um, that gray area is, is there, but the more public it is, um, the more it leans towards being a public performance. Mm -hmm. So let's say we concluded that something is a public performance. How do you go about getting permission to use music for that? Well, public performance is actually one of the easiest licenses to get. Um, up, there are six exclusive rights under copyright law. Two of them deal with public performances, but for dance, probably there's one that mostly you're having to worry about, and that's the public performance of the composition itself, like the sheet music. So it doesn't matter who made the sound recording. Really, the rights are about the song itself. Um, and the way that you do that, if, if you are performing at a venue, like a club or um, something like that, the venue itself should have licensing in place with organizations called ASCAP, BMI and CSAC. What those organizations do is they monitor and collect public performance royalties for the public performance of the compositions. So the venues contact ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. It's three different organizations and say, I want to have music in my venue. And they ask them all kinds of questions. How big is your venue? Um, what's your capacity? How square footage do you have? What are your hours? How often do you have music used? What types of uses are there? Do you just have a jukebox or do you have the radio on? Do you have live bands? Um, they go through a whole checklist of questions and then they come up with a licensing fee that's specific to that place. And the place pays the fee. And now anyone they want to have come in and entertain, they're covered by the license. Gotcha. So that would cover say a dance studio or a restaurant or a nightclub, et cetera. So yeah. it's specific to the venue. Exactly. Now they also, if it's like a, an event, maybe you decide um, I'm going to do an event. Actually, the way that Joy and I met, she was playing an event. So she could tell you about the license that she had to obtain for, for her situation. I'd love to hear um, that story. Sure. Um, I started, uh, I, we were doing our first um, Dark Folly stage show, and this was before we had our band, so most of our music was, that we were performing to was recorded music. And um, I did as much research as I possibly could on my own to find out what I needed to do to get uh, permission to use the music, and then I was uh, put in touch with Valerie, and um, she was able to walk me through um, obtaining the rights. And we actually ran into sort of three different issues. The venue I was performing at had only an ASCAP license. And several of the songs we wanted to use were covered under BMI. Um, so we had to get a, a, a BMI license for that particular show. We also ran into issues with um, artists that were not licensed under either. They were independent. They hadn't registered their music with any of um, those, um, any licensing agency. And so we had to contact them directly and get um, permission from those artists to use the music. And we did have one case. I think there was a, there was a gentleman who was, um, I can't remember what the circumstances were. He was traveling somewhere in Africa and we could, he was the band leader. He owned the copyright. 
we couldn't get in touch with them to get permission. So we did have one song that we had to to change and decide not to use. Um, but the uh, the other artists we got permission um, uh, directly, and then we did pay a one time like event license fee to um, BMI to be able to uh, use that that particular those those few songs that were covered under that. We also had one instance of um, we did have one live piece which was actually a drumming piece that had been arranged um, by somebody that we uh, we did have to get we did ask even though it was all traditional rhythms the arrangement. Um, can technically be copyrighted, so we did get we did get permission from that person to use that as well. So um, it was yeah, it was an interesting process, and it's what made me going through it myself. It's what made me um, bring Valerie up to Portland to talk to, to to present a workshop about it because I realized you know I worked at a law firm and was ignorant of all of this, so I couldn't imagine um, you know all of the issues that other people um, run into. So you know, when, when I do a show now. Um, and we go to a venue, um, if we are using, we have a live band now, and generally we use music that's in the public domain, so we don't run into that issue, but we do have a couple of songs that um, our band plays that are covered under ASCAP, and I usually do ask the venue, what license do you carry, so that um, we can then determine if we can use the, if we can play that particular song or not. Mm -hmm. So. I've got two follow-up questions on that. Um, you know, one thing that I've run into when I when I was producing my own DVDs and also in the course that I'm giving on video production to other for other dancers is that sometimes it can be really hard to figure out if a song is in the public domain or not. You know, there's so many things that belly dancers here think of as traditional that are actually songs from the 50s that are still under copyright in Egypt. Yep. Uh, yeah. You know, how do you go about doing that research? Sometimes, you know, Googling gives you contradictory answers. Well, I, in in our case with Dark Follies, I'll just say what we do, and then Valerie can answer. The, you know, I think it would be better for her to answer the broader question. We will only generally use music um, that was written prior to 1923, which is when there was a, a big shift and change in copyright law, um, and where there are a few exceptions. But um, most compositions prior to that time um, are in the public domain. Now, there aren't really... Um, a lot of recordings prior to then, which would be a different kind of of um, copyright, and the few recordings that are are things like wax cylinder recordings that aren't really um, that quality. You wouldn't use them anyway. But um, but yeah, we generally stick to older older music, which um, helps 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 with us. But as far as determining broader if something's in the public domain, I'll let Valerie answer that one. <laughs> so. Yeah, that it, it can definitely be a. a it requires a lot of detective work. Um, as a starting point, you can go to ASCAP or BMI's websites, and they have searchable databases that have the songs that they cover the public performances of. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the great thing, Joy mentioned earlier that one of the pieces that they were using in that show that they did was an arrangement. So something can pass into the public domain and a new composer can do an arrangement of the public domain piece, and because their arrangement is original and fixed, they can copyright their particular arrangement. So they can't copyright the, the song that went into public domain, but their particular arrangement, they can. So you can have a song that has passed into the, into the public domain, and the version that you're wanting to dance to is actually an arrangement that's covered by copyright law, uh, so it, it adds some interesting layers onto things. So I think starting with searching the ASCAP and BMI databases to see if the song comes up, and they have contact information underneath there. So if it is covered by copyright, now you have some names to research further. So you can then check the copyright database. If it's copyrighted in the United States, you can take the name that you found that was listed as the author and look for it there. You can search by song title as well, but remember when I talked about the one registration for collections? Mm -hmm. If you search by song title, the song title is not going to come up. Just the collection title will. Mm -hmm. So that's why I had this sort of sideways way of looking at it. You find out whether ASCAP or BMI or even CSAC are monitoring the public performances to find out who the rights owners are and then go at it that way. And that tends to be, it increases the chances of uncovering who the rights owner is, if any, 
and being able to have a conversation with them. Gotcha. You know, a related issue that I found when I was doing some of my own searching is, you know, because a lot of what we dance to is in Arabic or other languages that don't use the Roman alphabet, sometimes transliteration makes searching hard. So, you know, when I was looking up into Omri is what I thought would be a really straightforward example, whether Inta spelled with I Inta or E Enta made a really big difference. Oh. Right. So it's complicated. Uh, it is. You know, are, are there any services that will do this for you for money? <laughs> um, actually, music attorneys tend to do that sort of thing for money. Mm -hmm. um, there are some music clearance companies, but they tend to focus more on if somebody wants to record someone else's song, mm -hmm. they'll get the licensing for it. So usually you're sort of left with, attorneys to help you with the navigation of the um, rights and finding out who owns it and tracking them down. And it can take a long time. It, like I said, it's a lot of detective work. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, you know, you talked a little bit about the licensing process. So I'd like to dig a little bit deeper into some specific use scenarios. Sure. So let's talk about teaching. So first off, you know, do I need a license to use music in my classes? Absolutely. Just like the venues that you know, you're going out to clubs or whatever, you're using music in a commercial way. So you would need ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC licensing to cover the songs that you're using in your studio. Now, I rent space at a studio. Is it my venue that's responsible or me? Um, well, it's going to depend. When you rent the space, are you doing business under the umbrella of the studio, or are you doing it under your own name? I'm doing business as myself, so I'm only renting the use of the space for the specific time that I have my classes in, and my students are paying me directly, so they're not paying the studio for me. So that's another one of those little gray areas. Um, it might be seen that the studio itself's license covers your teaching in their studio, but the performance rights organizations might say, well, you're not actually them. You're just renting the space, so you're independent of them, so you need your own licensing. So I'm not exactly positive on how the different performance rights organizations would handle that situation. So it would be best to double check on that and be on the safe side and, and find out whether you would need additional licensing or not. Absolutely. But in the simple case, let's say that I open a dance school and I hire teachers. If I yeah. get a license for my students, they would be covered, right? Absolutely. If the business itself is licensed, all the people that work under that business, it would all be covered by that one license. It would be the, the place okay. itself is covered. Gotcha. And you know, how much do teaching like venue licenses for classes typically cost. Does it vary a lot or a little? Or It's going to be kind of like earlier when I was talking about that they're going to ask a lot of questions. They're going to ask, you know, how many nights a week do you teach? How many, how many rooms are you teaching in at the same time? How many teachers? They have a whole checklist of questions that they're going to ask to really give you an accurate quote that reflects the use of music that you're doing. So if you're like, huge mega dance studio that has four separate studios going simultaneously from 5 in the morning until 11 at night, yours is going to be much more expensive than the single owner, single studio, um, you know, 5 o'clock to 10 o'clock weekdays dance studio. So it's going to be really catered to your business. Gotcha. You know, it sounds like there's also some gray area around whether it's the physical space or the business that's covered. So what if, you know, for example, you have a business that rents and teaches in different locations. So, you know, usually I rent in the same studio, but I've also taught classes at universities. Does my license follow me, or would that depend on the specifics of my arrangement with the licensing company? Yeah, it, it's going to depend. Um, if you're mostly based in one physical location, that location is going to have its own license. If from time to time you travel to places that don't have licensing in place, you might have to get specific event licensing to cover those places that you're going. So it's it's going to depend. And the, the, the rights organizations like ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC 
they're really, really awesome about explaining exactly what you do and don't need. So whenever you have a doubt, you can pick up the phone and call them, and, and they're pretty helpful. That's good to know. I know a lot of people are kind of scared of them. People have gotten a phone <laughs> call from BMI out of the blue saying, you should make sure you have a license. So it's yes, good to know that once you're in a business relationship, they're okay. <laughs> yeah, they also have some great worksheets on their websites. Um, ASCAP and BMI more than CSAC, but they have like worksheets like, so you're a dancer. These are the licenses. <laughs> these are the situations you're going to need these types of licenses. So um, they're pretty helpful. Excellent. Now, you know, what if you're teaching online rather than face to face in a physical venue? How does that change? Uh, well, I think that what's going to frame the answer best is where the law makes that distinction between accredited nonprofit educational use and for profit educational use. So fair use is harder to show when you're making a profit from your business. So online, you're probably going to need a lot of layers of licensing to cover what you're doing if it's like a video that you have like out on YouTube and it's just out there. Um, the more private it can be seen as, the more it falls into possibly um, being more unlicensed. Um, it's, it's tricky. It's such a new area of law that we haven't really seen a lot of cases where we've gotten some indications of what is going to fly and what isn't going to fly. Um, YouTube is sort of, we've figured out what works and doesn't work there. But things like Skype, I mean, technically, if you are teaching a lesson to students over Skype and you have like three students logging in from different places and you're doing the same things you would be doing in your studio just using Skype, then technically it's the same as if they're in your studio. Mm -hmm. So you would need the same licensing for your studio as you would if they were physically in your studio. But then the question is, well, How's anyone going to know that you were on Skype with your three students? You know, how is that going to be found out? So it's it's tricky. So that's one of those areas where um, I can say what the law is, and then it's up to people to decide what their comfort level is with risk. Sure. Now, you know, for a gray area example, so what if I'm, you know, let's say I'm doing a private lesson over Skype, and the student puts on the music on her end, and she's playing it and she's dancing to it and I'm giving her feedback and instructions. Is that her responsibility? Is she doing anything wrong? Well, that would be sort of the same situation if she brought in a CD to your studio. It would be the same situation. So technically you would be um, sort of <laughs> responsible for making sure that the things are licensed, but that's where we're we're saying you know, the law hasn't quite caught up with the logistics because how could you possibly be like, stop playing that song. I don't have a license for you to do a public performance over the phone because, you know, so it's, there are little areas like that where there's a disconnect and it just doesn't become feasible to try to follow the, what we've always done to, there's this new technology, how do we figure it out? Um, so I, I don't have an answer for that one. So, you know, just do your best and... Hope for the best. Exactly. 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 All right. So, you know, we've, we've covered a couple of teaching questions. So, you know, if we're talking about giving a performance, um, you know, we've talked about this idea of public performance, and obviously when you are popping in a CD and dancing to it, that almost certainly counts as a public performance if the public is invited. Uh, so, you know, are the rules different for a private CD gig versus that's open to the public? So let's say, you know, Uncle Bob's 50th birthday with his cousins, but you're bringing the music versus your studio's dance recital that you have sell tickets to? It's going to depend on the venue. If Uncle Bob's birthday is going to be at a restaurant, they'll need to be licensing in place. Um, if it's going to be in his closed door house with family and friends, then it wouldn't need to be in place. So it's really going to depend on where it's taking place and how public the place is and how private the place is. And, you know, if it is something where licensing is required, like, you know, a restaurant or a function hall or something like that, you know, who's responsible for the licensing in that situation? Is it the dancer who's bringing the music, the event host who hires you, the DJ, or the venue? <laughs> 
Well, typically, um, the bigger the fish, the more responsible they are, I guess you could look at it. Um, <laughs> Although it would be easiest for the person that's using the music to know whether, you know, it's in the public domain or not, in most cases it starts with the venue. The venue is bringing in entertainment so they should be licensed for whatever happens. Um, and then the next level down would be if the venue isn't licensed but there's a promoter or an event coordinator bringing in entertainment, then they would be responsible because they're in the best position to know that it's unlicensed music and they're the one bringing it in. Um, and then at the very bottom you've got the, the dancer or the artist. Um, typically people don't sue them for not having a license to do one dance at a club, typically they're going to go after the club. But under copyright law, there is the opportunity to sue anybody who's infringing upon copyrights. So it could go from the dancer all the way up to the venue. Gotcha. Technically. But I mean, in most cases, when people are going to file a lawsuit, they're going to go after where the big money is. And that's typically the venue. Gotcha. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about this idea of a studio license, so something like a dance studio that has their licensing covered. If there's a group that's affiliated with the studio, like let's say the dance school's advanced student troupe, does their license cover only things that happen on the premises, or if that troupe, say, goes to a street festival, are they covered by that? It's limited to the dance studio itself. They would need separate licensing that would follow them to outside events that are not covered by an existing license. Gotcha. Now, you know, we've, as we've talked about this, it sounds like anything that is, you know, a larger venue that's been in business for a while or big event producers have probably run into this issue before. So it sounds like if you're going to some kind of event and you want to perform, it, it sounds like it's worth asking them if they already have. Absolutely. A license for their event or for their venue, and that can, in some cases can save you the headache. Absolutely. I think the safest thing is to ask them, do they have licensing in place? And in some cases, you're actually doing them a favor because if they say, what? <laughs> then you can explain it to them and educate them so that they can get their things in order as well. Now, it used to be like in ye old days before digital, um, where you could have like an outdoor festival that somebody coordinated and they didn't know about the licensing and bands came, they played, dancers came, they danced, and only the people there really knew what was performed and the chances of someone from ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC being there were very slim, so it was rare that people would get caught for that one-time thing. But these days, it's so rare that someone doesn't make a video of a performance that they're at and post it to YouTube or someplace mm -hmm. else so everybody can see it. So it's, and then with the software available to just, it's kind of like little robots going around taking little samples of music and looking for the algorithms and identifying unauthorized uses, it's much easier for them to monitor and identify unlicensed uses. So these days, much better to err on the side of caution and to ask the venue, do you have your licensing in place? If they don't and they're not willing to, to really have a clear idea of what songs you have are with which um, performance rights organization. So if you can narrow it down and, and have your dancers just stick like just ASCAP or just B, BMI, it makes it easier because you you can just say, okay, well, if the, if the venue is licensed by ASCAP, then we're fine. We can dance. We can use all the songs we want to. Um, if they're not, then you would have to contact, much like Joy did, the organization say, we're doing this one event we want to make sure that we're licensed and you would get a license just to cover yourself. So you getting a license wouldn't cover everybody else there, it would just be for your particular performance. Gotcha. Now you mentioned that, you know, asking them whether they have the licensing in place, you know, what wording would you use? You know, did they say licensing? Do I have a driver's <laughs> license? <laughs> I, think the easy, <laughs> I think the easiest way to ask is, do you have an ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC license? Uh, yeah, and that's pretty much what I do when I'm going know, to a place, and I, that's exactly what I ask. <laughs> so. 
that that cuts through everything because usually when they have it, they have a sticker either on the door or near the door that says licensed by. So usually they've seen that walking in or out. So even if it's a general manager that doesn't know, they can find that out pretty easily. Gotcha. Now, you know, in the Boston belly dance community, we're really lucky to have a lot of live music venues. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I'm going off to the Athenian Corner to perform, the band is going to pick my music. Very often I'll tell them, let's do a Turkish-style show, and I leave the rest to them. So mm -hmm. In a situation like that, do I have any liability at all for licensing? Or I'm up there and I'm dancing, or is it up to completely the restaurant's responsibility in a situation like that? So the band is performing live? Yes. Um, it would be the venue's responsibility because the venue is bringing in both live musicians and dancers. Mm -hmm. So it would be the venue's responsibility to make sure that they had the licensing in place to support the entertainment that they're bringing in. Gotcha. So for all of those of you out there who are afraid to dance to live music and to let the band do what they do best, there's a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm is not to say that you should never there. ask for what you want. but. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, you know, I'd like to move on to video a little bit. So, you know, there are all kinds of applications in video for dance, and how we use music and other copyrighted works can be really complicated in that context. Um, so let's say I want to videotape or performance, say, my student recital. Whose permission do I need to do that? Well, before we get to that, what are you going to do with the video? Well, there are all kinds of situations there. Let's say I want to keep it and watch it at home because I thought, you know, this dance was great, or my daughter was in it. There's, I want to make copies for my daughter's classmates, so they have it. Mm -hmm. Or there's, I'm the videographer, and I'm going to sell a copy. <laughs> or okay. let's say I want to post it on YouTube. There are all kinds <laughs> of situations. And each single thing has all different licensing issues around it. So let's start with, you want to make a video of your students so that you can do a critique so that you can write up notes for each dancer and say, well, here your arm should have been this way or something like that. Um, that might fall under fair use because what you're doing is you're doing a critique. You made one copy. You are watching it in the privacy of your home or at your studio. And it's meant for educational purposes of critique and criticism. So a situation like that, you probably wouldn't need licensing like for the music or the choreography or those sorts of things. What you might need is kind of outside of copyright, it would be more on the side of the dancers themselves to sign a release allowing you to capture their images on video. Mm -hmm. So that's what you would need for that. But if it was just you're really the only one seeing it or maybe you show it to the class to show, you know, maybe you meet with each class individually and say, these are my general comments, let's take a look and see how we can improve. That could be a classroom type educational experience. Um, now, we're assuming that if you're doing it in a classroom and showing them the video, that you do have your licensing in place because that public performance of the videotape would be um, covered by your license. So there's that. Um, if you wanted to make copies and distribute them to all of your students so that they could then take them home and look at themselves. Now you're getting into an area where you're going to need licensing for all different layers of that. You're going to have to look at the music. The composition itself, to link it with video, needs its own license. The sound recording needs its own license. Um, so there's going to be a lot of layers there. And then, again, the releases from the performers to allow their images to be captured. So that's going to get more involved than the last scenario. And then... And it sounds like if the, someone else's choreography was done in that performance, their permission might also need... Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so there's going to be a lot of... It. <laughs> it's, it's going to get more complicated. And now your last one where... You're, you're a videographer and you want to make a video and sell it, well, you're going to have a lot of work to do clearing everything. Not only are you going to need to make sure that you have written permission of all the performers, you're also going to need to look at the stage and everything up there and make sure that there's nothing copyright, 
works uh, covered by copyright that appears on the screen. So any artwork that's covered by copyright Ooh. or things like that, you have to look for those. Um, and then, again, for the music, if it's covered by copyright, you're going to need to contact the rights owner in the composition to get permission to sync that composition with the dance in the video. You're going to have to contact the rights owner for the sound recording for each song um, and get permission to use that sound recording in connection with that dance on that video. Um, you're also going to need permission from all of them to include it in a DVD that you're going to sell. Um, again, the choreographer, you're going to need permission from them to sell copies of that choreography. Um, there's there's going to be a lot of layers to this that you're going to have to go, and this is going to be on a dance by dance, song by song basis. So it could be a little bit, um, a little bit of work to get all of the copyright clearances um, taken care of. And unfortunately, the types of licenses that are involved are for the compositions a synchronization license, for the sound recording, it's a master use license, and these are the types of licenses that are negotiable. There's no set amount that you just go, oh, I need this license, and they give you a flat fee and you do it. Um, the other party can negotiate, and they can set the price, they can set the terms. They could say, sure, it's going to cost you this much, and I want this much money from every sale of your DVD. Mm -hmm. So they can set the terms. So it's, it's a lot of work to clear a DVD for dance. Absolutely. I've had... Uh anything from, oh, just go ahead and use it and give me credit from the artist to $500 for the first 5000 and then we have to make additional arrangements after that. So it can vary a lot. It really can. And But the great thing is if you're, if you're calling and working directly with the artist, they can give it to you for free or just for credit. So it's, it's that negotiation process, but it's asking permission. Um, some people mistakenly think, well, I'm not going to make a lot of money off of this, so if I do make a lot of money off it and they come see me, then I'll pay them. Uh, but it's, it's just not quite optimal to do it after you've infringed upon the work. It's much better to take care of it before you release it and make sure that everybody's on board. Uh, assuming that they're going to say okay doesn't really work. It, it has to be that they have given their permission. And you want to always keep a nice file folder that has all of the written confirmations, whether it's email or you know anything else that you have that confirms that yes, you have my permission to use this. Keep it all in the folder; makes it nice and easy. Yeah, and yeah I want to add one thing to that too, and that's that you know the people that I've contacted, I, I've, mm -hmm. I've worked most, I've mostly licensed music from independent folks, which can simplify things a lot in some cases and make them more complicated in others. But for the most part, people are really happy to be asked. <laughs> you know, I, I've oh, yes. made some great relationships just by saying, hey, I love your stuff and I'd like to license it from you. You know, I've had um, uh, the producer even, you know, put out a, a note on Facebook when my video was released. It was great. You know, so in a lot of ways, doing the right thing isn't just about covering your butt in good karma. Sometimes it can be, you know, a really nice community and a really nice business move. Oh, definitely, and you can do some cross promotion, and it, it can lead to other things. It's people are always flattered when you say, "I like your music so much, I want to make a dance to it." That's a flattering statement. So most most artists, I mean, there's exceptions, but most appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing where when an artist has an agreement with someone else that handles that for them. Um, so like if a songwriter has an agreement with a music publisher or a recording artist has a deal with a record label, those, the artist and the songwriter, they no longer have the ability to give you free permission. They've given all control over to the publisher or the record label. So sometimes they might want to give you permission, but they don't have the ability to give you permission. So sometimes asking that extra question, oh, are you signed to any record labels or music publishers? Should I be talking with them as well? Could be an extra layer to save um, yourself just in case. They might not have thought about those deals that they have in place. Gotcha. That's a really good point. 
So, you know, stepping back to you know, different video scenarios, you know, let's say I'm in a troupe. Mm-hmm. This isn't a business thing. It's just, you know, a bunch of dancers who got together and we like performing. We go to street festivals. And, you know, let's say that I'm filming the piece that we're working on so everybody can take it home and practice. Do all the same licensing questions apply? Um, it kind of, it's very similar to the dance studio owner who makes the copies for her students to take home and look at. It's It kind of falls into that area again. So, because what are they going to do with them when they get them home? Um, what happens if they get really excited and they post it to Facebook or to YouTube on their channels? So you have to kind of think of what's the worst case scenario? What if they do these things and I'm the one that created this? It kind of goes back to me. Mm-hmm. Not so that you dancers they... would do things like that, but oh, it happens. <laughs> it happens. So it sounds like it's a technically you need it, but nobody will catch you unless somebody does bad things. Kind of, yes, yes. Gotcha. But as a lawyer, I have to tell you that that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think you know the most common video application for dancers is you. Not everybody makes an instructional video. Not everybody has student recitals to film. Um, you know, what kind? When do you need permission to post on YouTube? I'm sorry, I couldn't. So if, if I'd like to post a video on YouTube, you know, is it the same set of scenarios as for a DVD, or are there different rules for that kind of context? It's very similar, um, although YouTube's kind of tricky because there's some rights owners for the compositions who have agreements behind the scenes with YouTube that we don't know who they are, but they're out there. And so for those catalogs, you could post a video and everything's fine, but that information's not public, so we don't know who they are. Um, so it's best to sort of go through the same process that you do for other things and find out from the rights owners, is it okay if I post this video on YouTube? And sometimes they'll say, oh, we have an agreement in place, it's totally fine. Or other times they'll say, sure, the license will cost this much. Well, and I, I, I think probably everybody's had the experience of uploading a video and you get that little notice that says um, you have copyrighted material as part of this because they're like those programs that Valerie was talking about um, will hear the music and say, and recognize it and say that that's a copyrighted that that's copyrighted material uh, and and sometimes and it'll ask you if you, will you allow it to be posted as long as there's advertising it's one of the things that'll come up um, when things are uploaded but I think a lot of people have known or at least heard of someone who YouTube takes it down completely or does the weird thing where they remove the music. <laughs> I don't know how they do that, but I've seen that happen hmm. too. So, Gotcha. Okay. So, you know, kind of the next frontier in, you know, video distribution is everybody's moving away from physical DVDs and downloads. And I know that Apple thing is coming up more than it really is, which is driving us all video all us video editors crazy. But um, you know, is the set of permissions that different for a physical DVD versus a program that you sell online? It actually is um, because now you're tying into the exclusive rights under copyright law to make a copy and distribute those copies. So there may be an extra layer for when you're making a copy. So whether it's a physical copy or a digital copy, if you're able to get that copy, it changes from if it was just a streamed piece of um, copyrighted stuff. Okay, so it sounds like there's a difference between the tangible DVD, the downloadable video, and the streaming only video. Yeah, there's, there's a little bit of a difference. Between well, it's really the difference is between the streaming and the copy. The physical copy and the digital copy are very similar. Gotcha. All right. And you know, it sounds like the big thing that I'm taking away from most of this discussion is when you're asking for rights, just be really, really specific about every possible way you could use it. Yes. <laughs> and get it in writing. <laughs> yes. Yes. Definitely. Um, and now, go ahead. 
Um, back to YouTube. Um, one of the things that I see a lot, and some of my clients will will try as well. They they try putting a little disclaimer up on their YouTube channel saying, "I don't intend to infringe or claim ownership in this other person's copyrighted material," um, and they think that that by saying, "I don't intend to infringe your copyrights," that that somehow gives them protection from. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it doesn't just just saying I don't intend to to steal this candy bar as you walk out the store with it doesn't really take you away from the fact that you just shoplifted the candy bar. So it's kind of the same thing with copyright saying I don't intend to copyright even though I'm I, I don't intend to fringe even though I'm blatantly infringing right now. It, it doesn't offer any level of protection. It almost seems worse because you're saying yeah I know I shouldn't be doing this but I'm just going to add in this little statement and hope you don't care. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, you know, when I've been doing, you know, research specifically in the context of a commercial DVD, you know, there there seems to be a lot of jargon out there. You know, you hear about synchronization license and master use license and mm -hmm. uh, videogram license and all of this. You know, if you're in a position where you are making a product for sale, is it better to get a lawyer or is it fine to just be real to just write out in great detail a plain language description of how you plan on using it? Um, I think that the safest thing to do, if this is going to be something you do for a living, is to work with an attorney on the first project to make sure that you have practices and procedures in place to follow for those next projects. That way you're getting some legal advice on exactly what needs to be done and you're, you're making sure that you're covered and, and you're safe. I think that you can learn a lot through calls like this and books and videos and articles, um, but when it comes down to actually doing it, I think a qualified person to advise you is really helpful. And then you can move forward and you know what to do and then you can you know, be in a better position not to get sued. And being in a better position to not get sued is where we all need to be. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it doesn't sound that rosy, but that really is the end goal. Yeah. Excellent. Well, this has been awesome, but, you know, we've actually been at this for an hour and 15 minutes, and I think I could keep going in until midnight, but I don't think that everybody will stay with me on the line. So I'm going to start bringing the interview itself to an end. Um, and I do have a couple more questions for you, but before I do that, I want to let everybody know that we do have time for a question and answer setting session. So any of those folks who are calling in by phone or by Skype, if you have a question that you'd like to ask Attorney Lovely or Joy, you can press star 2 to raise your hand. And those of you who are listening on the webcast, you can type in your questions in that little box on the left-hand side of your screen. So while we're waiting for everybody to get set up, um, I'd just like to ask, you know, Attorney Lovely, if listeners do want to learn more about copyright, or if they need a good copyright lawyer for their project, what would you recommend? Um, I think that it's, it's important to do some research and find the right fit for you. Um, there are volunteer lawyers for the arts all over the place in the United States, and I think that that's a great starting point because they often have educational programs about copyright law. They're specific to musicians or filmmakers or dancers. And even if you're a dancer, I don't think you should feel limited if they only are offering one for um, musicians or just for filmmakers because it's still copyright law and you can learn quite a bit that way. Um, as for finding a particular attorney, usually word of mouth is the best way or um, <laughs> interviewing them and finding someone that fits what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And if you know any of my listeners do need individual advice, are you taking clients? Um, sure. Um, just visit our website. We're at musiclawfirm.us. Um, to check us out and see if we seem like someone you'd want to work with. Um, Joy and I are going to be working on a series of videos coming up probably later this year. And what we want to do is create little videos that cover the basics of copyright law and make it kind of fun to watch. Um, so if anyone's interested in seeing those when they come out someday, um, we have Music Law Firm on Twitter and Music Law Firm on Facebook. And we'll be posting up announcements about that as they start coming out. Excellent. And I will make sure that I include the Twitter and Facebook links in the show notes.
Oh, thank you. Um, excellent. Now, I remember when I was first talking to Joy about having you on the show, she mentioned that you have done some workshops together for dancers in New England. Is that something that you have any plans to offer again or something that you could do upon request? Yeah, if, if people are interested, um, at the time, Joy found that there were a lot of dancers up in the Portland, Maine area that had questions about public performances and licensing and all of that. And so she pulled that whole thing together. Um, if there are other groups that have similar questions and would like to have Joy and I come and discuss these same types of issues, we'd be happy to go as long as it's, you know, in the area. If they want to take us to Hawaii, we wouldn't say no. <laughs> oh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> the right time of I, year. <laughs> that's true. So, so if you want to, you want to fly us someplace, we're happy to go if the season is correct. <laughs> expenses paid, I'm sure, but the, let me tell you, all that is standard. You invite a workshop teacher, you pay her expenses. Excellent. Uh, let me just check and see what we've got in the way of questions coming in. Again, those of you who are on the call or Skype can press star 2 to raise your hand. And those of you who are on Skype, remember that star 2 on the Skype keypad, not on your keyboard. Okay. I don't see anything immediately coming in. So, you know, I'd just like to ask both of you, um, you know, if the listeners take one thing away from this call, what would you want that to be? Joy, why don't you go first? Um, well, I would say that um, as artists, when we perform and, and we do something, we want to make sure that we are um, given proper credit and, uh, and hopefully compensated for it. And to remember that people who perform music they are, are in exactly the same position. It can sometimes, I think, be easy to forget when you have a, a recording and you think you, you know, you've paid for that recording um, and you're using it, that there is somewhere behind that a band who is trying to get their music out there and trying to um, make a living doing, doing what, they're, what they're doing. And to remember that when you're – it can seem a lot of times when you're talking about licenses and things like that that, that it's very impersonal, but at the, at the other end of that is another artist. And just to you know, to keep that in mind that when you're when you're obtaining those licenses or you're putting on a show and you're using someone else's work that you know you want to you would you would want the same um, respect and and courtesies given to you as an artist and that it, it needs to go both ways. So damn straight. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I would say um, what I would want your listeners to take away is that copyrights aren't the enemy that understanding how they work allows you to operate your business more professionally and to protect your own choreography, as well as to decrease the risks involved with infringing other people's rights. Excellent. I love that, too. All right, we have, do have a couple questions. So our first question is here on the webcast. So Vanessa in St. John's Newfoundland asks, do I need to have a license to create a choreography to a piece of music, such as during company rehearsals, teaching it to the dancers, and so on, or is the licensing specific to the public performance of the work? Well, that's a good question. Um, the public performance would be done in the studio. So if you're operating a studio and you're playing the music to teach the dance to your students, that is a public performance right there in the studio. So it, when you're in a commercial setting, that is a public performance. Okay, but it sounds like the creation of the choreography, the act of creating the choreography to the music doesn't necessarily infringe on the music rights. It's only when you start using the music, the music in a public context. Yeah, the music being played is a public performance of the music. Okay. So, so if you're in the of, studio by yourself creating the choreography, that's not necessarily... If you're in a studio that your business is um, you know, having students and teaching dance, um, and there's no students there, I'm sorry, I misunderstood the question. So she's all by herself, and she's using the music to create the dance. So that would probably be more considered a private performance, but she should have the licensing in place to cover the studio anyway, just in case it would be considered a public performance. Okay, so it sounds like the line is when other people... <laughs> Show up. Yeah, yeah. It, when she, when she's teaching it to somebody else, then we're into that commercial nature of it, mm -hmm. and so that's when it becomes a public performance for a dance studio. When she's by herself, 
if she was like at her home or something like that, then that would be more private. Gotcha. So the, creating a choreography to the music is not an infringement, but then using the music with the choreography in any context that could be a public performance is? Yes, or in the gotcha. context of teaching students the choreography to the music. Those would be public performances. Gotcha. Okay. Vanessa, if I've misunderstood your question at any point or if you have any follow-up questions, go ahead and type them in at the box that left. If anybody else on the webcast has any questions, you can type those in as well. And we do have a raised hand. Uh, so we have the caller uh, whose number is in Richmond, Virginia. You are unmuted. Hi there. Hi, it's Ann Kemp. How are you doing, Indira? Hi, Ann. It's great to hear from you. You know, I finally was able to join the call, and I have been listening in both rapt attention, nodding, saying all of this makes sense, and at the same time, I have a very deep sinking feeling in my heart. Um, and I, want, I guess my question for you, Valerie, is does any of your advice change for someone who is a hobbyist and not doing this for business purposes? The distinction being based on talking with my tax advisor, the income I earn is so low that it is at this point hobbyist income. Ah, uh, well, unfortunately, the IRS looks at whether you're a hobbyist or or doing it for profit um, for tax purposes, and copyright law looks at it in a different way. So mm -hmm. even though you're a hobbyist, you would still, and I'm sorry to say this, but you're still going to have to follow all of the things that the the professional um, okay. people will have to do. I was afraid of that, but I figured I would, would ask. <laughs> okay. And then you have mentioned a ton of links. You mentioned the Cornell University site and ASCAP and, and all the other. Could you share those links with Indira and then have those be shared out to us? Oh, absolutely. I'll make sure those go out with the show notes. Excellent. Well, that was a great question, Ann. Do you have any others while we've got you unmuted? Not that I can think of. I'm too busy trying to pull my heart back together. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to put you back on mute, but if you think of anything else, you can raise your hand again by pressing star two. Okay. Thanks. Thanks again. Thanks, Ann. All right. And that goes for everybody else, too. If you're on the phone or Skype and you want to ask a question, go ahead and press star two. And if you're on the webcast, you can press, uh, you can enter that in in the little box at left. It doesn't look like we have much else yet, which I'm taking as meaning that we are so extraordinarily thorough during the interview. I know I got you into a whole lot of gray area corners. <laughs> That's always how I interpret silence, is that I did such a marvelous job of confusing people that they are just speechless. Excellent. <laughs> Well, before we go, we're going to allow just another minute or so for folks to type in or think of their questions. Um, I'd also like to ask the listeners, uh, if you'd like to share your most important learning from this call, that would be awesome. So the little tidbit that sparked something for you or the thing that you thought that was the most valuable, I would love to hear that. Again, if you're on the phone or Skype, you can press star 2. And if you're on the webcast, you can type that in at the box that left. And while we're waiting um, for folks... Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I, I just wanted to, to add something. Um, as a, as a dancer, you know, myself, I, I, I both produce shows with um, Dark Follies, and I also sometimes show up and perform in other people's shows. And I don't want people to, to be um, uh, discouraged or feel like this is overwhelming, because I think there's a very, there's a big difference between if you're the one who's in charge of the show, and you're the one who's just who's been asked to perform and you're showing up in, in a, um, like a group, um, like a, a student recital or a hafla or, or something because, um, and, and that a lot of times, well, you know, that a lot of times these, these licenses and things are covered by the venues that you're performing in. Um, and it's just a matter of asking and to not, um, to not think that this is going to somehow limit what you're able what you're able to do it can sound really overwhelming <laughs> and complicated, but it actually really it, it really isn't. So that's a great point. I think once you've done something once, it stops being quite so scary. Yeah. Right, and like I said, there's a big difference between being the one who's putting on the event and the one who's having to check all those boxes and make sure everything is covered, and being the one who is just showing up to perform. Um, 
you know, there's kind of a, there's a, there is a bit of a difference in terms of what your responsibilities could be. So, mm -hmm. and that is another reason to be an awesome and incredibly professional participant in other people's shows because they have way more to worry about than whether you've got your dressing room the way you want it. Right. <laughs> All right. So we do have a raised hand. Uh, let me go ahead and unmute Anne. Hi, Anne. Me. Well, you asked what, what really kind of resonated with us, and mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, we all enter this dance as, as the student and the person who wants to go step foot out on stage. And what I'm hearing is that is a relatively easy thing to do. Like like you just said, Joy, it's it's you know really easy to do your part and make sure that you are you're complying with the laws. But I think what's really hit home for me and what I'm personally wrestling with is, you know, I spent years in a troop and we put on events and we certainly got insurance for those events to make sure that our patrons were not damaged, but we never bothered to deal with the music licenses. And as a result of that, I got into making the videos of the performance because I wanted to be a videographer. And hearing the laundry list of permissions that I should have gotten is a bit overwhelming. And it's it's wonderful to be armed with that information, but it's really caused me to reevaluate you know, is it something that when I say I'm doing, when I say I am a professional videographer, am I really acting as a professional when I'm not even aware of the law and the rights that I should be protecting of others? And so thank you for <laughs> enlightening me on this. Um, I, I think you've really made it really clear for, for someone to understand where things become complex and where a few simple actions can be doing the right thing. So thank you for giving me that gift. Oh, you're welcome. Yay! Thank you, Anne. That was, you know, I think that was a really honest response to that, but I think it also is really nice to get an optimistic perspective when you see the laundry list. So thank you for sharing that. Excellent. All right. Well, it is almost 9.30 here, so I think I'm, I hate to do this, but I think I'm going to bring us to an end. Um, so, again, I would just like to thank Attorney Lovely and Joy for coming. This has been incredibly helpful and fabulously geeky, and I'm so glad that you can make it. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Excellent. And thank you to all of you who are attending live and to those of you who are listening after the fact. I'm really glad that you could join me. And this is the end of the call, but that doesn't mean that the conversation has to end. So we do have a private Facebook group for folks uh, who are Clubhouse listeners. I'll send out an invitation to that with the show notes. Um, again, there is an approval delay for that since it is uh, a separate group. So if you can't post immediately after joining, don't worry. I just have to approve you. And when I send out those show notes, I'll also include a link to the call recording, a link to uh, the music law firm and to some of the individual informational links that have been mentioned. And I'm also going to include a link to our Clubhouse feedback survey. Uh, the Clubhouse is something that I run, but it's something that we do together. So I'm really interested in what topics you'd like to see covered, what speakers you'd like to see, and any ways that I can improve the Clubhouse. Uh, so that will be sent out either later tonight or tomorrow. And our next call is already scheduled. That will happen on Tuesday, August 13th at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. And my guest, Princess Farhana, is going to talk about posing for the camera. Uh, she and I talked together at the Mecca, Prof Mecca Professional Dance Conference and Retreat a couple of years ago, and that was the only course that I didn't get to take while I was there because we were in the same time slot, and I'm so excited about that. Uh, so come and join us on Tuesday, August 13th, and we'll have that as well. And the last thing that I want to say is that the Billy Dance Geek Clubhouse is the come on in kind of clubhouse, not the no boys allowed kind. So if you know anybody else who would like to geek out with us, uh, please invite them to join us. They can do that at bellydancegeek.com slash clubhouse. And until next time, happy dancing. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks for listening. For more geektacular resources, visit bellydancegeek.com.